Hello, Scott. Hello, and goodbye, Eugenie. How's everyone doing? Can you hear me? Hear you loud and clear. Welcome. So this is a pretty neat, uh, you know, stream you've got going here. Thank you. Uh, we're we're pretty pleased with how it's been going, uh, especially again as we threw it together last minute. We've had a couple hiccups here and there, but uh, it, it seems to be running running all right. Good deal. Well, uh, how do you want to go about this? Do you want me to just prattle on about things? Uh, are there questions that are popping up or? Uh, we would be more than happy to have you prattle on uh, about whatever whatever you care to. Um, and as questions come in, we can we can send those over. Hopefully, uh, hopefully people will, will donate for questions. Uh, so remember, we're doing this for Black Lives Matter. All your all your donations are going to various Black Lives Matter charities. Um, Correct. So yeah. So, so here, here's the deal. I'll ask. I'll answer any question anytime, but only with wrong answers unless you've donated. Uh, <laughs> which could be fun strategy. too, of course. But in the meantime, do you have any current, like, ongoing research you can talk about? <laughs> So right now, all of my waking hours, uh, except half of this one, uh, is actually finishing up my dissertation, which I'm defending on the 30th. But of course, you have to get dissertations to your committee, you know, before you defend. So uh, I'm in the final, like, three-day period or so. <laughs> um, and in that, I'm continuing on some research I've presented before. Uh, of course, some the, the work that we published in the Lori Specimen uh, Hesperon Authority, sorry, a year ago uh, is in there, but also um, I've been working for years now with uh, Warren Porter and Dave Lovelace and Ben Linsmeyer and others on uh, using a, a modern thermal heat balance, mass balance niche modeling program to like retrofit it to work on things that are not alive anymore. And we actually published a paper on that not long ago uh, that Dave Lovelace was the co uh, was the primary on. So um, a lot of that was underpinning the the desire to use it in other scenarios. So what I've been working on is, is the end Triassic extinction. See if we can figure out from a mechanistic modeling point of view why the winners and losers turned out the way they were, or if it had nothing to do with heat tolerance and thermodynamics. Uh, and it turns out it did have something to do with thermodynamics, or at least it sure looks like that. But can't say a whole lot about it more just yet, except that I was surprised by the findings and uh, I'm kind of excited to share them at some point soon. Sorry, I have a puppy in the room, so I'm not like afraid I'm gonna fall off my chair or anything, but if I'm looking down, she's running around and I'm making sure she's not getting into anything. Um, that's that's fine. Can you show her in case there is a specific donation for that coming in? <laughs> sure. I can show do that. the doggo. Yeah, I'm sure she'd be thrilled to be picked up and held in front of the computer, but I can do that for a donation to a valuable cause like this. Meantime, we have no donation, but somebody's asking how you make skeletals. Well, since it's the wrong answers only, uh, mostly I dig them up and I take very high contrast photos kind of manipulated later and make sure it's fully black and white after posing all the bones in the right way. Truly fascinating. Um, yeah, I mean, do you want me to answer that? I, I totally can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, sure. So uh, I, of course, have been doing this long enough that I used to do them on papyrus, but um, Okay, but seriously, I did used to do them back in the days of like multiple uh, tracing paper overlays, like, you know, when I wanted to redraw bones I'd already drawn and then pen and ink them and stuff. In fact, um, the last part, of course, after you do all that is to like get it on like a bright light rear projector or tracing table or something back in the day and then like transfer it onto thicker, um, more stable, you know, drawing paper that can take the ink and then stay that way, hopefully indefinitely. I don't know if I know where any of those are anymore, but a true sort of embarrassing, I think, story in retrospect is I uh, 
I had an incredibly uh, sweet girlfriend in high school when I first started doing those, like around the Jurassic Park era, the first one. And uh, some of them, she totally helped like color in the bigger black parts after I'd like inked the outlines and was like working on one end of the animal and stuff, which I feel is like really super nice. And she probably like should have gotten to co-sign those, although I don't think any of them are in use anymore. But so anyways, that was the old fashioned way. Uh, but since, you know, it's become the modern digital age, I transitioned through a really weird period where I would draw sections and then scan them when like flatbed scanners got cheap enough to do it and then like assemble them or break them up even more digi digitally if I had to before I got comfortable doing everything in Photoshop. But now that's what I do. Now I have, I'll have like files with dozens or hundreds of layers with like all the known photos of the fossils and figures and stuff that I can get and also with close relatives, you know, in like the first several dozen layers and then other layers for like dorsal vertebrae or sacrals or ilia or whatever so that you can like pose everything over the top in different layers or readjust them as you go. And then it's all just a matter of drawing. I actually, I used to do it with mouse because uh, I couldn't afford one of those fancy Wacom, uh, well, I had an Intuos, but I didn't have the ones, you know, that actually show you the image that you're drawing on. And I don't know, you're all probably more talented at using this than I am, but what I could never do for the save my life was I could never draw a line, no matter how much I like to pick it up and then put it down in the same spot. Um, and if you're like doing a light, like a painting, that isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world, but when you're drawing a line that has to be precise, I just couldn't make it work. So I used to always do, believe it or not, mouse outlines. Um, and here's a pro tip for some of you who are trying to get a good curve with a mouse someday, because like even high-end gaming mice that are more precise, you still kind of get some tracking wobble as you go along. Um, but if you hold on the shift key, probably know or many of you probably know that like you can draw a straight line from one point to another, right? You like hold it down and it'll just connect the two points. Well, if you do that with lots of really little lines, you get a nicely controlled, apparently curved at any normal resolution. Uh, shape. Um, however, since then, like Microsoft has made these surface products where you can like, you know, draw right on them. And so now uh, I do most of my scale pulls on a one of those big surface studio um, devices downstairs because then I can see where I picked up and I can put my my virtual pen, my stylus back down in the same place. Um, and that's, that's it. Uh, one thing I would say, because I, I still see this done the other way, it's hard to make yourself do it, but when you're drawing bones and they're gonna go on an outline, which of course has been all the fad since the 1980s, um, I still see a lot of people draw where the lines sort of split the sort of outline of the shape, which means that part of the line is overlapping the shape, right? Cause that's like the way we would normally draw something that's just standing on its own. Like if I was gonna draw a picture of this lovely little T-Rex here without a silhouette behind it, the line would be hopefully like right on the edge of this, meaning that like part of the line is physically because the line takes up space like a couple pixels into it. Um, but the problem with that and then putting on a black background is the line is black and the background is black. So what you've done is inherently shrink the bones. Um, and not by necessarily a horrible amount, depending on how high of resolution, how small the line you're using, but especially with like long bones, I've, I've noticed there's like, you tend to see it a lot where you get them and they're just a little narrow because there's just a little bit of overlap rather than drawing the line literally completely on the outside. So like the inner part of your pixel of your line is still on the outside or right on that edge. So there's a tip. Just a heads up, we just got a donation to see the pupper. Oh, to see the pupper, okay. Hold on a second, you're gonna have to look at my window and the wall for just a moment. All right, pupper. Hey, I know you're excited. Oh, what's that? I got to have asked. Where did you get that? Can I? Come here. Yeah. Come here, and we'll take this. No, that's okay. Nothing much. Much. I want to see a collective awe in the chat. Here we go. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, she is, and she is just about that sweet. Hi. How old is she? Um, she is ten months. She'll be one in Aww. August. 
So she's learned to do most all the things, although probably not while she's sitting on my lap. <laughs> so sweet. This is the content the internet demands. Right? Ooh. Oh, no, you don't want to do that? <laughs> so do you want to do skeleton drawings? Yes, I do. So. Yeah, she's very fluffy. She kind of needs a bath these days because like this is her quarantine style, but not too bad. Real question, does she crunch bones? She crunches the heck out of bone. Um, so <laughs> true story, we actually have a supervillain name for her, Destructor, because if you give her any like normal dog toys, especially ones that look like cute little animals, she will have like their faces ripped off like the same day you give them to her. So we have to buy her like fancy super chewer ones or give her like, you know, the cow or pig bones that are like for sort of bigger dogs because she'll just go right through things otherwise. But at least she doesn't chew things not first. What's that? Yep. Yes. Another time she would be an apex predator. <laughs> Of a very small ecosystem. <laughs> Are you an apex predator? Yeah. Vicious. You can even see like how well developed her whoop, jaw closing muscles are up there. Yeah. Way over the top of your sagittal crest. Look at that. I feel it important to to make a note that we've actually that we have two donations <laughs> to just to make sure that we see the dog. So your dog has raised thirty dollars for Black Lives Matter. Yay! Oh, and now she really wants to go down. <laughs> yeah. Mission accomplished. <laughs> yep. And we well, and we have an actual question yep. now. Um, of all the skeletal drawings you've made, which oh. was the hardest one? Ooh, I can not just answer that, I can show that to you. Uh, I pulled a few out in case we need stuff to talk about, and one of them is definitely that one. <laughs> um, this one was done for the, the Smithsonian uh, I overhaul. don't think we have you on screen share. No, I know. I, I'm letting it open before I take away the... Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. I'm on my uh, my laptop, which isn't slow, slow, but while I'm also video chatting, it doesn't whip things open with the same alacrity it does otherwise. Um, oh, that's a little slower than normal. Come on. There we go. You can do it. Push those electrons around. There. <laughs> okay, now I just got to... I have sharing screen permissions, I assume. Looks like it. Do it. There we go. Tell me when it comes up. Oh, I have to do this, sorry. Uh, is the fish coming through? There is. Oh. oh That'd be stripped it is. Oof. <laughs> A I love that I'm done with it, but I hated doing it. This is why I will never work on fish. Yeah, I, I love drawing fish, but I feel your pain. <laughs> um, Zephactinus was also a real pain, but that one is already out there, so I thought I'd toss this one up. Um, yeah, seriously, all the all the ribs and all the rays and just. Mm. <laughs> Ooh, um, so who is this? Thriptidus. Okay. So in general, are fish usually the hardest altogether skeletals to do? Yeah, I mean, almost any marine vertebrate becomes obnoxious because they have the awful habit of adding more segments to their body, which comes with both new vertebrae and new ribs. So like ichthyosaurs and mosasaurs are sort of obnoxious in their own right, just not quite at the same you know, god tier of annoyingness that uh, that bony fish are. Non-tetrapod bony fish. Gotta be monophyletic, you know, about this. 
Um, so yes, yeah, so that's that is probably was the biggest pain to do. <laughs> And it's just the repetition of it constantly because, yeah. So out of the out of the non fish, uh, what would what would have been the most pain in the rear? Um, let me take pain in the rear a different way, where it didn't cause me to like fall asleep in cold sweats at night, curled up in a fetal position or anything. But um, the Majungasaurus that I had to work on a lot, it's, it's, it's at a good place now and it has been for a while, but uh, I think I had to work on scaling or rescaling that for more than I have with any other like dinosaur before finally getting, you know, proportions that were, while looking not right are in fact correct, so. Oh, and in a different way of thinking about the word pain in the butt, uh, Spinosaurus is still out there, <laughs> um, which I can't share today in part because I don't have one done, um, even though I have parts of ones done. But uh, just because of like the fact that everyone wants to know, and of course I did one long ago, which is obviously out of date. So people, at least some people seem to want a new one, <laughs> which I don't understand. But uh, the incompleteness of the remains and the problematic nature of trying to cross scale the one or more specimens that we got recently with like the one that was blown to smithereens years ago is a uh, daunting and kind of a pain in the butt. Let's see what else I have that I could toss up there. Uh, here's some more stuff. I realize that, of course, Diatrima probably didn't really eat little horses, but it's still fun to write. Um, did that come up yet? Yep. Yeah. So there's just a couple more pieces I did for Smithsonian. It didn't go together like this. I just couldn't resist once I'd done both of the classic horse and terror bird, you know, figures to not throw them together to scale. One thing that was fun about that is I've, I've often had people ask, uh, why I don't add soft tissue to them. And I, it's not a thing I'm going to switch to doing, but it is sometimes things that clients want, like in this case, the Smithsonian wanted fur and feather outlines for the appropriate critters. And so it was kind of fun to like create additional layers of that for the ones where it was necessary. So that's a fun thing. That's, that's awesome. I've always loved the, uh, always loved the terror birds. And hello, Dr. Chin, we are not, uh, we're not ignoring you. Uh -huh. oh, that's fine. Sorry, Hello. is that the misunderstanding for your, your time slot? Um, yes, I, I, I thought we were, I was supposed to be on at 2 p.m. Mountain Time, which is in 15 minutes. Yeah, that's, I'm not sure how that happened. Again, the problems of throwing things together in like three, to, four days. <laughs> um. Yes, we're we're working out what to what to do with that. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, Scott, we had another question. As soon as I find where our donation tracker went, um, on average, uh, how long does the skeletal drawing process take? Um. Well, of course, it's been shrinking. You know, as as it becomes more technologized. <laughs> um, so up until moving to the Surface Studio, I think they're at a place where it was usually uh, after however many days or hours of research were necessary if someone didn't supply me with like all the data, which doesn't happen all that often. Um, it was about two to two and a half days to actually like render one out, you know, on the computer. But now I've probably cut about 30, 35% of that time down maybe 40, depending on if it's not a fish. Um, uh, because being able to like draw directly on it, you know, on a big screen has definitely sped up the process. Uh, I still use the shift straight line trick. Um, just that now that I'm using a stylus, I can both do that with more precision and then switch instantly to like drawing a organic curve, you know, 
with uh, without having to like change my technique. That makes it quite a lot faster to outline individual bones. Awesome. That is a excellent answer. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see what else do I have? The point is on the beak. <laughs> That's the, the amusing, amusing little bit in chat is uh, the arm. The arms on terror birds are so hilarious. Like, what's the point? And uh, and the response is the point is on the beak. Nice. Oh, here's something I I'm going to plop up if for no other reason than so people can see it. So I did a puibertherium skeletal years ago. Geez, I think in the late 1990s, actually. Uh, so that would have been the old pen and ink <laughs> technique at the time. Um, I completely redid it uh, when I had to do this one for the Smithsonian, but I haven't yet had a chance to actually make like a straight up version to post. Like I need to, I always draw the uh, sternal elements, which they didn't want there because um, of the way they had their, their set up. And I have to, you know, do a version that has no shading, obviously, because all the bones are always there in my skeletal drawings because, you know, um, that's how I do them. And I got to finalize the uh, outline without the fur and stuff. But if anyone wants to think of using the Puebra Therium that's currently on my website, uh, they should instead use this one, a screen cap it or something. Um, it should be, uh, it should go into the, the stream saved video uh, and should be available uh, sometime after we stop the stream. Cool. Rock on. Also, somebody, somebody can clip it, I think. Cool. Scott, it's so nice to meet you. I've seen your drawings forever, and I I've, have uh, utilized some of them sometimes legally. Thank you. <laughs> um, it, it's so nice to, to meet you. You've done so much for the science. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's good to meet you in this new pandemic way that we meet people only. Yes. We have, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say we we have we have the good Karen. <laughs> a good Karen? Not well, not the meme Karen. Not 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 the, not the meme tastic. Uh, oh. <laughs> version of of your name. Right, 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 right. <laughs> it's a I real did. joy to have that happen to your name. I'm sure. <laughs> it's been kind of surprising to talk about to hear to hear people uh, be very critical of or call someone a Karen, it's like, well, that should be a, that should be a compliment. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah that I, is I an amazing skeleton. Uh, so this is uh, Metaxotherium. Another fun one done for the Smithsonian that I haven't posted anywhere else yet. Screenshot time. <laughs> and let's see. Got a Stingar Champsa here. Also not available online currently. Um, sorry to interrupt, Scott. Yeah. Uh, we have a, another another question. Any insight into the creation of your Uintetherium skeletal? Uh, and what are your opinions on creating mammal skeletons as opposed to dinosaurs or other reptiles? Um, well, dino uh, mammals usually have really lame tails, which is actually fantastic because tails take a long time to draw. <laughs> um, in fact, one of my, like, I have like a very informal, like top five rules of skeletal drawings, uh, that are probably have seven or eight rules that I interchanged with through in there. But one of them is that if there's a mistake in the proportion of the animal, it'll be because the tail was like much too short. It seems like people just get bored and start drawing them smaller and smaller as they go. Um, unless it is a giant sauropod in contention for being the biggest ever, in which case the arrow will undoubtedly be, be in the opposite direction if there is one. Um, otherwise, mammals aren't harder skeleton wise. Um, and I mean, they're if anything easier with silhouettes because we have mammals. You can go out and poke and prod and dissect and I mean, I teach a 
dissection course every fall where I make people dissect mammals. So, um, and hopefully most of them don't hate me for it. But uh, so that's, yeah, I don't know. I like mammals. I'm not personally as interested in mammals just because I haven't worked on them as long, but they're, they're, they're a fantastic topic. Many of my best friends are mammals. See, I know we're running down on time here. I have one more, I'll, unless there's a question, I have one more I'll toss out just to create a little bit of a stir. Um, well, two more, one to set it up. So this was a thing I posted recently, of course, so this won't be new to people, but it's looking at, you know, reposing dinosaurs because of their tails, you know, not probably actually arching way up into the air. Um, which results, you know, since they're sort of teeter tottered over their their acetat their uh, hip socket there, you know, up if you pull it down, there's really no other way for it to go unless you're crouching the limb more. Um, and it, it's more so in mine than it is like in Greg Paul styled ones because Greg still illustrates the uh, metatarsals really vertical in his um, with like a essentially ungular grade condition with just the claws on the ground and then the pad behind it. But most papers like the work by Matt Bonin and stuff have, you know, gone with the, uh, wait, I can blow this up, can't I? Yeah. Uh, have gone with a much more uh, plantigrade, uh, you know, foot uh, pose, which actually further lowers the hind quarters and then further elevates the neck, which is why, like, if you look at my titanosaurs, you know, the necks are all upright, but there isn't actually a huge amount of flex in the neck. It doesn't have to do the, the U-shape up thing. It's because the backs are already arched up pretty naturally, and it only takes a minimal flexor to get the neck up at a more, I guess, even though I hate to say giraffe-like pose. Um, but anyways, I was thinking about this because, like, I had to do some stem birds recently, and I looked at a bunch of bird skeletons, including some of mine, we often draw them horizontal because that's what we've been doing with the backs. But of course, most birds actually keep their backs upright day to day, like in the 20 to 30% range, depending on the clade. And if they're not like waterfall. Um, <laughs> and the reason I bring that up is it's, you have to kind of wonder where did that happen then? Um, and so I'm not saying this next part is right, but you know, we have, several paravians with relatively flexible bases of their tails, which are often treated as being for flipping up in the air or whatever to like use for display or perhaps to use for some sort of, you know, whipping them around for stabilization while they run, uh, changing the center of gravity or what have you. But it could also just be that they're more flexible in their ability to shift the posture of their back and that flexibility would allow the offset, you know, of the, uh, tail to like roughly remain where it, it, you know, sort of hangs out the best horizontally where it can most affect the center of gravity when you move it from there, et cetera. So return of Godzilla sores in some cases, maybe. Awesome. Well, cool. Uh, about out of time on that. Um, thank you very much for joining us and answering questions and, and sharing some of the, uh, some of your drawings. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, next up, uh, we will be having uh, Dr. Steve Brusati, I believe. Um, Sorry, having a having a bit of a brain fart. Yes, thank you. thank you very much for coming. Um, and and Karen, <laughs> very very sorry for the misunderstanding on on our schedule and uh, and what's going on. Um, we do actually have a question for you that came in last night. Uh, if you want to to answer that while we're waiting for the next bit, let me see if I can find it. Uh, 
All right, well, I will go to make room for you and Karen. Um, so um, I, I so, Sorry, Scott, I just wanted to say, I apologize. I did not mean to step on your presentation. I'm a little- Not at all. About. It was great to have you. <laughs> nice to meet you too. I'm just, um, just trying to figure out what's going on. <laughs> That's totally fair. As, as are we all. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for having me. I uh, I enjoyed being had. No, wait, that's not how, what I meant to say. Um, oh my. Well, we, we we certainly enjoyed your doggo. Um, <laughs> oh, and our our. Do you have a book? I think there was a question asking if uh, any of these you're going to make a, a big book. Ah, there it is. Does Scott intend to make his new Smithsonian skeletals available online, online and or in a book? So eventually, as I have time that isn't related to doing everything for my dissertation for the next several weeks. Yeah, I do plan to move some of the skeletons that are still like in my vault, but don't need to be there for legal reasons anymore online. Um, and then yes, I definitely have longer term plans to do a book, but I don't wanna just do a, here's my skeletons in a book, please send me, or the publisher rather, money. Um, I'd like to hopefully make it more valuable. <laughs> um, so it probably won't be like a short term thing because I'd like to have some maybe external opinions and some discussions about the pros and cons and variations that you could use in interpretation and stuff like that. Not just like, this is the way it is. Even though ultimately when you make a skeletal reconstruction, you have to settle on a way because, you know, it's a static image. But if you, you know, with a book, you could take time and show off different variant variants and stuff and kind of talk about like plausible and non-plausible differences and stuff. So that's something I'm hoping to do. See you. It would be hey, awesome. <laughs> I'm just on my way out, but good to see you. It's good to see you too. I'm, I'm, I'm not meaning to kick you out if you're in no, 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 it's okay. Uh, so, I don't time. You're on here too. I'm sorry about this little mix up, but Karen, if you want to split the hour, um, that's okay too. It, it, it doesn't matter to me. I just can't unfortunately go any later because I got a really young son here. It's quite late. All right. Well, Thank you so much again for having me. I will be watching the stream. All right. Thanks, Thanks again, Scott. Scott. Uh